taking back to Texas.
we need, need that. It looks like there's two chairs on the table from that gel too, right here.
So if you're interested in joining our team, we have a sign up um, at the table back there. Um, I also wanted to mention there's going to be education, uh, public education hearings at the Capitol July 25th and 26th. A lot of people from around Texas are going to be showing up to the Capitol. So if that's something you're interested in and speaking on, um, we're going to be carpooling. There's going to be buses uh, commissioned to bring people. It's going to be a really big day at the Capitol, July 25th and 26th. Um, also, you can sign up to be that kind of thing. Sign up to be a citizen advocate with True Texas Project. Go to our website and um, just contact True Texas Project and ask to be added to the citizen advocate um, list to, to find out about things like that where we really make a difference. Um, the classes that she mentioned are really awesome. I've taken one of them and it's well worth your time. Um, these classes, August 5th and 6th, are going to be in, in Webster. So um, I'm going to go to the Saturday classes. Uh, it's maybe a 45 minute drive from here. Saturday morning early, you don't have to worry about traffic. So um, again, True Texas Project website will have information about that and how to sign up. They're free classes. Um, okay, just to put on your radar, there's school board elections coming up this November in the area. There's going to be four seats available in Tomball ISD, and I think two seats available in Klein. Does anyone else know any, any coming up this November in the area? Uh, that's all that I know about right now, but keep your eyes peeled for that. The candidates are going to need help. Um, okay, so passing the hat. If we, could, if Colleen, if you can start, you can bring the basket around. Um, we do this at all of our meetings. This is totally, totally optional. This is a free meeting, but it does uh, cost expense, some expenses um, to, for example, travel expenses for our speakers, um, at the venue, rental expenses. Um, so if you would like to help, you can throw in a few dollars. Um, the best way, actually, though, is to sign up to be a recurring donor on our website, like she said. So um, that's all about that, and I think Colleen is going to bring that red basket around. Um, do we have any candidates in the room? Okay, I didn't think so, but <coughs> yes? Congress. We have a congressional co uh, candidate here? 38 is in the independent. Oh, okay. Are you on the ballot? Yes. Okay. I got the five Okay, would you like to come up and introduce yourselves? Oh, sure. We always at True Texas Project are open to any candidates that are on the ballot. Um, we generally give a moment. Um, so I'm sure we'll have a lot more speakers in the coming months.
Okay, guys, we're so happy to have you all here. We have two great speakers tonight. Our first up is Joey Lynn. So um, I like this chick. She homeschools her baby. I homeschool my kids. Let me tell you, it's a peak. So here we go. Joey Lynn is a stay-at-home mom who has been married to her high school sweetheart, Robert, for 15 years. And she is uh, passionate about her homeschooling, her 11-year-old son, growing her own vegetables and her flock of back of cured chickens. And um, she wants to learn about um, hope sustainability. So one of her main goals as a mother is to teach her son how to think freely. Hello. Uh, establish independence from the government, the education system, and the supply chains, which even surprises her. We can thank Biden for that one. Joey Lynn and her husband, Robert, recently were catapulted into the fight to defend free speech as the biden Pierce campaign staff and the Democrat politicians filed a lawsuit against them in federal court under, wait for this, guys, Ku Klux Klan law of 1871 nearly flying Trump flags when they drove past the Biden bus through the Texas, through Texas during early election, like in, in 2020. Can you believe this? So, Joey Lynn has an optimistic attitude amidst the oppression as she believes God has called her and her people to boldly stand up in the face of this tyranny to maintain God given freedoms for generations to come. Let's hear it for Joey come Lynn. On. Let's go, baby. those values and those things. He should not be teaching me those things. 
Uh, this, is, this time he was in public school, uh, and I was on a venture to start my own business, and things looked very different. And so I told my husband, I need you to help me understand why we're voting for Trump, because I don't even understand. I know that we're pro-life, like at the very core, but I really don't understand how our values line up with his policies. And these are the things I'm hearing from people that I call friends, and is this stuff true? Can you please help me understand it? So we started researching politics, figuring out that Trump was somebody that we wanted to vote for. So uh, I realized I needed a new group of friends. And we decided, my husband said, I've seen this Trump you know, caravan, this train driving around town. Why don't we get some flags and join that and try to meet some new people? And so that's what we did. So three weeks after that, three weeks after we basically lost all of our friends because we posted pictures of joining the Trump train and everybody called us crazy racist bigots. They were like, oh my God, we didn't know that you were racist. And we were like, well, this is exactly why I was afraid of saying how I felt because I felt like that backlash was brewing and then it was really affirmed when we went public with our values. And so since then, you know, we have a whole new group of friends. They're way better. <laughs> They're way more like-minded. They're people that we've met in rooms like this with people like y'all. So we joined the Trump train. Three weeks later, the Biden bus came through. We thought, okay, we're going to get a really cool picture with the Trump train next to the Biden bus. That was our whole plan. We never would have imagined in a million years that we would be where we're at now. Uh, and as a result, we have cared more and more deeply every day about the state of our nation. Our values are, uh, you know, we're trying to teach those to our son. We are um, trying to change the tide and to now help other people understand how important their rights are and how to defend them. And so I have to thank these individuals that are suing us because they lit a fire in us that we didn't know that we had. So we drove next to the Trump train, or we drove next to the Biden bus with the Trump train. It was pretty boring. Nothing really crazy happened. The bus was kind of driving all over the road. It was really difficult to form a Trump train behind the bus like we hoped. So we showed up, we took a picture, and we kind of left. And then, um, you know, we started to see in the media these crazy headlines like white supremacists run Biden bus off the road, uh, Trump train attackers, you know, Ku Klux Klan. Um, Whoopi Goldberg and The View said that we were emboldened racist bigots that had crawled out from under our rocks. And first we would fly Trump flags next to the Biden bus, but later we'd be burning crosses in people's front yards. And being new to politics, I was like, okay, so this is how the media works. Um, that is not what happened. We just drove down the road, a road we pay taxes to drive on, which is completely insane. We exercised free speech in the exact same capacity that the Biden bus did. They had a massive sign on the side of the bus, and we had flags on our vehicles, and we were all driving down the road, yet because we dared to disagree with them, now we have to pay the price financially. And so, you know, eight months of slander in the media, nothing really came of it, and then I got a call from a friend who said, I'm pretty sure that what I'm about to tell you, you don't know because I think I would have heard it from you first. You're all over the news. You're all over CNN. Do you know that you're getting sued for flying Trump flags to the Biden bus? And I was like, okay, I would. I think I would know if I was getting sued like that. It's not happening. We haven't gotten served any paperwork. There's no way that that's real. In panic, I called my husband and he's like, calm down. It's just propaganda that can't happen. That's, there's no way we didn't do anything wrong. Four weeks after we found out about this on CNN, and you know we were getting all kinds of hate mail um, and threats, we actually got served. Fourth of July weekend, we were finally able to understand the scope of the lawsuit. So they had a national press release where they informed the public that they were suing us, and we didn't even get to know what was going on for four weeks. Um, and so finally we got this, this lawsuit. It is a civil complaint. I learned at that time that's very different from criminal. Um, I was watching what you know was happening to the people January 6th and was afraid I would get thrown in solitary confinement, lose my child, that my life was over. I didn't know what was coming. I learned this is a civil complaint. So these are individuals that are upset and traumatized and offended and want to be compensated for my exercise and my husband's exercise of free speech. It's completely tyrannical. They're weaponizing the law system against average Americans who have their own opinions. Uh, our First Amendment says that we should be protected when exercising our freedom of speech, especially in regards to politics without fear of repercussion from the government. And that's exactly what they're doing. So they're suing us under the Ku Klux Klan law of 1871. They were claiming that we banded together on a public highway to suppress black and minority voter rights. They're saying that we had a premeditated plan of assault to run the bus off the road. Uh, none of which happened. These are malicious and frivolous lies. They're fabricating in the media. Uh, and then 
and they implicate or they, uh, you know, they incorporated them into this 62-page civil complaint. And so, you know, this fight is not cheap. In this federal level of court, because it's a civil rights matter, it, it can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, even at a discounted rate, to defend our family and to defend free speech, not just for us, but for all Americans. Um, we understand the repercussions of something like this and the type of precedent this can set in the legal system. And so as Christians, we believe that when God calls us to something like this, it's because there is a great plan and a great purpose, and he only knows how to win, and he only knows how to be victorious. And so we believe that he's going to use this for good, what they intend for bad. And so it's our honor and our privilege to walk on with great hope and great faith that uh, we're taking a meeting now, but that something great is going to come from this. So um, we try to maintain our hope and our faith. Uh, we did cash out our 401k. Um, and liquidated our savings account so that we could uh, retain our attorney and start to pay our legal defense trying to get this lawsuit dismissed based on the fact that they haven't even met the basic requirements of using this law against us. They haven't proven any racial animus or any racial motivation. I mean, they don't have a case here, yet somehow it's continuing to move through the legal system. Uh, we're assigned to a liberal judge who was appointed to the federal court by Obama and nominated by Cornyn, who's a total rhino. Um, you know, like, absolutely. As if he couldn't get any worse. Um, and the same judge, before Roe v. Wade was overturned, he uh, was assigned a lawsuit where the Department of Justice sued the state of Texas for Texas's heartbeat bill. And he ruled that it was unconstitutional. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals stepped in and it wound up appealing to the Supreme Court. And I mean, we're only two appeals away from the Supreme Court ourselves. So right now we are trying to appeal the judge's decision not to dismiss the lawsuit as he ruled that it would go to trial uh, by jury in federal court despite spending eight months trying to get this dismissed and upwards of $50,000 or more. Um, and so now we're headed on to trial, but we're trying to even appeal that decision and invoke the help of the Fifth Circuit. Um, in addition to that, I started trying to tell our story to groups just like this, to rooms just like y'all, to some uh, podcasts and outlets like Diamond and Silk or Flashpoint on the Victory Channel has had us on. And so uh, the plaintiffs referenced some interviews that I had done and said they didn't like that. We were speaking out about what was going on, and they filed a protective order to try to silence us from speaking about the details of this lawsuit. And, uh, you know, our attorney counseled us and said, that's completely ridiculous. Really, I mean, there's, it's not appropriate. He gave examples of scenarios where maybe that would be appropriate, and this just certainly wasn't it. But it shouldn't surprise us that if we're getting sued for exercising free speech, that they would continue to suppress our free speech when trying to expose the corruption. And so the judge ruled in favor of the protective order and has put it in place that uh, as we go through to trial and they turn over uh, discovery documents labeled um, confidential, that we wouldn't be able to discuss those with you guys. Uh, and so to me, if, if they have nothing to hide, <laughs> why would we not be able to speak about these details, right. details you guys deserve to know so that you can understand how the government is weaponizing the law system against average Americans and anything that would vindicate us, prove our innocence, and show that they're corrupt and lying, they're gonna find a way to cover that up. It's completely malicious, it's so cruel. Uh, but again, you know, we, we believe that God called us to this. We're not scared, we're not intimidated, we're not backing down. We're gonna continue to get louder and louder. Uh, we're locals in New Braunfels, Texas, uh, home of Worst Fest. It's a small German town and there's a 10 day uh, sausage party, basically, uh, in, uh, in either October or November. And so last year, we just thought to ourselves, Biden is the worst, and he just gets worse by the day. And so we made these funny shirts and signs uh, for Worst Fest, and they sold like hotcakes. And so they've become a part of our fundraising efforts to just grow up. Uh, spread the word and to raise funds. So we have set up a fundraiser through GiveSynco, which is a Christian-based platform. We didn't want to get deplatformed by GoFundMe. Uh, and so we've got a GiveSynco set up. We created a website which is freespeechdefender.com. There on the website, you can learn about our story. There's a 90 second video you can share. I know it doesn't seem like I can tell the story in 90 seconds, but I promise in the video I do. And you can share that with your friends and your family. Um, there's a tab that has legal updates. There's a tab that has media where you can see interviews we've done and a way to contact us. There's plenty of uh, ways to reach our fundraiser on our website as well. If you'd like to support us there, we're grateful for any any amount, $5, $10, uh, 
by the grace of God, we've managed to raise $172,000 in the last year, $5, $10, $20 at a time from rooms of patriots just like you guys. And we're so grateful for everything y'all do to help us stay in the fight so that we can defend free speech. Um, we've applied to maybe 50 or more nonprofits that claim that they help um, defend your First Amendment right, but they really focus on freedom of religion. We've yet to find one that's brave, bold, or has the resources available to help with free speech in regards to political expression. So hopefully, once we squash this, hold the left accountable, maybe try to recover some of our legal funds or hold them accountable for defamation, we can go on to help defend other patriots that are in the same situation, and freespeechdefender.com can go from just being a fund to help fight this fight for our family to help other Americans defend their First Amendment right as well. So we are so blessed that y'all heard our story and we'll be hanging around if you guys would like to pre-order a shirt. They'll be ready tomorrow. We can mail them to the group uh, for y'all to pick up at your next meeting. We've got yard signs, um, stickers, we've got cups, bandanas, and all the goods. And my son, uh, he's helping take orders at the table. So thank you guys so much. May God bless you. And y'all continue exercising your First Amendment right like a muscle. You make it bigger and you make it stronger. today is I could tell you everything about the Constitution. I talk about that a lot. We actually have a 14-week Constitution course we've been teaching for a long time now. We have a four-week apologetics course on how the Bible works with government. We have all these different things. And tonight, I was like, Lord, what do you want me to say? I, I, don't, I don't know what you want me to tell them. And tonight, we're going to talk about this, that when it's impossible is when your faith begins. Are you hearing me? It's when you think there is no earthly way this can happen. That's when your faith begins. So I think, too, to myself, when I grew up, I grew up in the 80s. I'm, I'm an 80s baby, I think. I, I mean, I was born in 1981. Uh, we didn't face a lot of the things that we're seeing today. The worst thing that ever happened to me growing up was not any kind of teaching in public schools or anything like that. I had a huffy bike that handlebar, the handlebars fall off when I was riding it, and I smacked my face on the, on the concrete. And now I look like this. <laughs> so that was the worst thing that happened to me, right? 
And then I had preachers for parents because in the Hispanic culture, you have church every single day except Tuesday nights. And if you're Mexican, you know what I'm talking about, right? And so I hated it. I just wanted to get out. So when I turned 16, I left the house. I was like done with, I was done with church. I was done with all this stuff. And I said, forget it to the Lord. And then when I turned 20 years old, he saved my life. Something changed in my heart. And then all of a sudden, in 2004, I was with a group that was going into public schools. And I heard this phrase. You may have heard it once or twice. Separation of church and state. So this was long ago. This was 18 years ago. And it, forgive me for saying this. I'm a pastor. It pissed me off, okay? Here's why. Because the Bible doesn't say go into all the world and preach the gospel except public schools. Right? right? So I was like, what the heck? Then someone hands me this DVD from David Barton on original intent. Changed my life. When I read the First Amendment, it protected my right to preach the gospel in public schools. And so that's what really revolutionized me. And now I've been telling Americans about the law, how you shouldn't be afraid. How in 2020, why is it that churches shut down when they should have never shut down? Because it was unlawful. It was illegal, right? And then when you're the only church in your county that stays open... People are nagging on you. They're like, you're, you're wrong. You're crazy. I mean, I can't tell you how many pastors called us for dinner meetings because they were saying to us, you're giving Christ a bad witness by staying open. You should listen to the law. And I asked them every single time we'd sit down for lunch or dinner, I would say, are, you, are they listening to God? Right? No, they weren't. Why would you close a place of healing and hope in the middle of a pandemic? It was, it, was, it was done on purpose. It was done to shut you up. And so it wasn't that that sparked me. I've been doing this for 15 years, preaching. On my own for about eight now. My wife is not here. Can I give you guys a quick praise report? She was diagnosed with colon cancer in March. Uh, she had a stage three tumor removed from her colon. Um, it was freaky. We didn't know what to do. So, you know, naturally, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I got to do something. So I didn't know what to do. I was just, we were taking her to treatments. Uh, and then last Wednesday, she told the doctor, I'm not doing these anymore. I'm not taking these treatments. I'm going to take a different route. The next day, they gave her a report on her blood, no more cancer cells. She was healed wow. in two months. <laughs> now, y'all, I don't do backflips. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> They're called barrel rolls, right? But man, I was barrel rolling for like a day. Y'all know what I'm saying? I'm praising the Lord, saying, Lord, you're still the healer. You're still the God that wants to be the God of Hebrews 11. You're still the God of the Old Testament. You're still the God that commands us to speak against the kings that are wicked. And guess what? They're not even kings, and they're wicked. You're the kings. You're the ones who hire them, and they're your representatives. So take heart, church, because you're the ones that are going to change this thing. Amen? So let's get into this. How many of you guys have social media? How many of you guys are into the demonic? Yeah. <laughs> right, we got all this stuff. We got the YouTubes and the Insta faces and all that stuff. Right, we've got uh, a podcast. If you guys haven't been on that yet, it's called Self Evident Podcast. We we got some really cool guests coming up here soon. You guys ever heard of Dr. Alex Newman? Oh my gosh, he's going to be awesome. I and mean, we just got some really cool friends out there. Uh, if you guys know Joe Z, he's one of those guys. He's a prophet, but that boy preaches. Uh, just some good characters, some good people that are in our corner. We have some really cool stuff over there, too. But before I even get into this, I don't even want to get into my table. After this is done, go visit that and give. We did. You want to help this right now. Because this is what's changing the nation. I can do all I can do. I can preach and save souls and do all that stuff. That's my calling, right? But when you get thrust into this, this is not even just a calling. It's now an anointing. And they have it. Amen? You guys, I mean, I was encouraged by you. And I think... If we could be honest with ourselves, you encourage us more than we encourage you. You really do. I want you to know that. So we call this one, God Shed His Grace on Us. Uh, this is actually the preamble to your Texas state constitution, humbly invoking the blessings of who? Almighty God. Come on, baby! We are invoking God right now. Not a government, not a state, not Abbott. Right. Come on, come on. Right? God. For what? For our liberties, our blessings. We ordain and establish this constitution and put that in there for a reason. This is John Adams. You know, John Adams was one of my favorite historical characters. What they said about John Adams was he was short, chubby, and loud. <laughs> <laughs> right? He was short, chubby, and loud. Th Thomas Jefferson said without John Adams, we wouldn't even have had independence. This guy was a debater. He was an orator. He was a mentor. He was a Christian. Right? He didn't do everything right. None of our founders should be put on a pedestal. There were some things that, guys, they were just like you, men and women, just like you. But they took heart, they took courage. 
And this is what he said. You can't even really read it because I made this for a big thing. But I made it, this made it a little thing. So I'm going to read it to you. But you can take pictures of this if you want. Or you, I'll send you the slides. I don't care. You know, there's no copyrights on this. I'm quoting dead guys, okay? So it's really fun. He said this, the second day of 1776, July 1776, would be the most memorable day in the history of America. Listen to this. He said, I'm apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. And then he said this, it ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by sovereign or solemn acts to God Almighty. So the first thing he said was on July 2nd, July 4th, we should be giving devotion to God first. Then he says this, everything else we do after that, it ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade with shows and bells and guns and bombs and illuminations from one end of the continent to the other. Yes, let's go pull out our grills. Yes, let's have a four-day weekend. Yes, let's throw some pistols up in the air. If you do that, praise God, we're in Texas, I hope, right? But he says first, before any of that, we better be devoting ourselves to God first. And I highly doubt most Americans did that. I wonder if we even thought about it. Because these guys did. And then he said this. You guys remember when Roe v. Wade got overturned? Who was happy about that? Praise God. Fun fact. Article 3 does not give the authority to the Supreme Court to make law. So it never should have been law in the first place. Right? But we all were happy. We were saying, okay, it got overturned. They, they finally got it right. We don't have jurisdiction in this matter. Praise God. I was happy for about a split second. And then I said, oh, man, now the work begins. Were we ready for this? Were we ready for what's coming? You who are church people, if you go to a synagogue, praise the Lord, whatever. Were we ready for this? I don't know. Because he says this to his wife. You will think me transported with enthusiasm. You think I'd be lit right now for, writing the de or for, for declaring independence. But he said, I'm not. I'm well aware, he said, of the toil and the blood and the treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration and support its efforts. Then he says this. This is where faith comes in. This was impossible. And I'm going to show you why in a second. He said, yet through all the gloom, I can see the rays of ravishing light and glory. I can see that the end is worth more than all the means. I think that's where we have to get as Americans now. The end is worth more than everything we got. And I'll tell you why. Because our kids are worth it. See, when I became a Christian, it was very simple. Your life is not your own anymore. You're bought with a price. I no longer live for myself anymore, Paul said. Right? It's the Christ that lives in me. Well, as an American now, when tyranny is happening, I no longer live anymore. It's for my children. This isn't for us. This isn't about us anymore. As a matter of fact, we may have to give up some pleasures, guys, because my kids need a better America than I have. And if I can't give them something better than I've been given, I'm a bad steward. I didn't ask for this fight. I didn't ask for this fight. I didn't ask for tyranny. You didn't ask to be put on national television to get sued by Biden. You, didn't, you guys didn't ask to be in this room right now to have to talk about law and policy, but you're here. And so let me say this to you very plainly. If you think it takes a majority to prevail, you've never read scripture. Because God never uses a majority in the Bible to win his battles. Amen? Amen. So I don't care if the hordes of the world come against us. I don't care how many times they sue us. I don't care how many times they try to shut us down or try to harpoon our arms. God is going to win in the end. He has to. He has to. It's in Scripture. Listen, the funny thing about Bible. I don't know how many of you are Christians in here, and if you're not, you're going to be one tonight. Praise God. <laughs> but listen, when I read Scripture, it's this simple. He did not write those things for us just to read. He wrote those things for us to emulate, to do them. So when he wrote a Hebrews 11 that says they subdued nations, conquered kingdoms, uh, put to silence the, the, the fire enemy, or the, the, the wiles of the enemy, then that means it can be done again. And if that's what it's going to take, it's going to take you and me, you and me, you and me to go do this thing together. Now, is there strength in numbers? Absolutely. But I almost wonder if God wanted us to be in this position where it was impossible so that he could finally move. So then at the end, when there's victory there, we can't say it was our hand. It was totally the Lord. It was totally the Lord. Amen? Let's get some preaching up in here. Now let's lighten the mood. How do we know Samuel Adams today? Beer. Yes, Lord. We know. And coming from a pastor, no condemnation. You're just going to hell. No big deal. I'm kidding. I'm totally playing. Samuel Adams, most people know him as the beer guy, but guys, he was one of the greatest preachers in history. This dude would go into churches and preach sermons. 
And he said this, we have this 4th of July restored to the sovereign to whom all men ought to be obedient. He reigns in the heaven and from the rising to the setting of the sun, let his kingdom come. How come you weren't taught that in school? You guys should read his deathbed confession. How he relied on the merits of the blood of Jesus for the remission of his sins. How come we weren't taught this? John Adams writing about the Lord and all these other things. Let's continue how it began. Um, you guys probably have heard this from pastors. I'm sure it's popular to talk about. But Romans 13 says we submit to all governments. No matter what. That's how we do it, right? Because we're Christians. We don't want to be a bad witness. And the Bible says we're to submit to every authority. No. And I'll tell you why. Because the, the, the Hebrew and the Roman ethics that were going on, they didn't have a republic like us. They had something called a monarchy. So when you see scriptures like render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, did you know we don't have a Caesar in this nation? You know who the Caesar is in this country? I'm looking at him. So render to who what is whose? Come on, y'all. Render to Texans the things that are Texans. And render to God the things that are God's. You want to know why taxation, the heavy taxation we're doing right now is illegal? Because they knew this. They understood this truth. Romans 13, let every soul be subject to the higher authority, right? What's the highest authority in this land? God. True. No, no, this land. Not spiritually. The land. The Constitution. God ordained us to have a Constitution as the main ruler of our government. If you guys read anything in the Constitution, there's not one provision against the American people. It's all against their own government. The Constitution was written to restrain the government, i.e., Romans 13 says, let every soul be subject to the Constitution. So what happens when people who are in authority break their oath to that Constitution? What's our job to do? According to the Declaration, it's our right and duty to overthrow such government, institute new governments, right? Now, let me set you free for a minute. You're going to hear this from your church friends, from pastors. You've probably heard it already. You're being rebellious. Guys, no. You're being obedient. They're being rebellious. Now's the time to flip the narrative. They're the ones breaking their oath, not me. I'm holding them to their oath. Amen? So now you're the obedient ones to hold them to their oath. Do you see how cool it is when you start changing your mindset? No, it's not me that's doing this. You did it. You just awoke a sleeping giant because I was willing for you to leave me alone. And then you started buttoning my business. Then you started pushing the button. Then you started attacking God. Then you started going after my kids in school. And I'm sorry, guys, but my kid is worth more than any life in this nation. My kids are worth more than anything because God gave them to me. I will answer to God for those boys. All three of them. And my crazy nephew. <laughs> you know, can I tell you a quick story about that boy back there? 21 years ago, his dad preached a sermon in a small church in Old Minnesota, and I got saved. Wow. We're best friends. That little boy I used to babysit when he was a baby. And now he's here. It's the coolest thing. His dad was too lazy. He didn't want to come. So he's like, fine, I'll send my son. Thanks, bud. <laughs> Let's talk about this. You guys know before 1776 happened, we had a great awakening. You guys have heard this before, great awakening, third great awakening. Second. Check this out real fast. John Wesley and Charles Wesley. They preached from, for four years, 1734 to 1737. They placed a great importance on seasons of revival. They said over 20,000 people got saved within those four years. Right? So that was one of the parts of the Great Awakening. Then we have this guy over here, George Whitfield. They said of George Whitfield that he traveled over 100,000 miles on horseback preaching the gospel. They said that you could hear his voice over a mile away. That kind of powered anointing. They said some 10,000 to 15,000 people got saved by his preaching. Listen to what he says here. He goes, I am verily persuaded the generality of preachers talk of an unknown, unfelt Christ. And the reason why congregations today are so dead is because dead men preach to them. Guys, they were saying that in the early 1700s. So people look at America and say, man, we were all, man, we were in. No, not really. Not really. Same position. We had over 3 million people in this country back in the day, and only 6% of them fought in the Revolutionary War. Most pastors wanted nothing to do with this. Why? Because of Romans 13. They preached the same sermons. We're no different than they are. We're not in any different position. Here's what I think is different. We are the majority. We just need to open our mouths. You know the best place to evangelize about your faith and politics? The gas pump. 
Nobody is happy at the gas pump, right? You can get a liberal saying, you like these gas prices? No, no, Russia. Now let's talk about that. What do you mean Russia? Let's talk about this. Do it all the time. And then you tell them, hey, I go to this church. You ever think about going to church? Ah, I don't like God. Why? He loves you. I mean, seriously, I just, I love those. See, it's so simple. If we just open our mouths, people will come here in droves. Matter of fact, next year when we come back, it'd be cool to see this room triple in size. All you got to do is open your mouth. You, listen, is it hard for you to brag about your husband or wife if you truly love them? I don't have one. Shut up. <laughs> no, it's not. But the God of heaven who sent his son to die for you and redeem you, that's not hard to talk about. He saved my life. He really did. I almost committed suicide. God took me from that. Imagine if I would have died. You wouldn't be in front of my chubby presence. And I'm just a kid, guys. I'm just a kid from Sleepy Eye, Minnesota. Does anyone know where that is? No. You do. Get out of here. Little House on the Prairie. Yes. Little House on the Prairie. Yes. Has 3,000 people in it. Nobody taught me how to preach. When I got saved, I just said, Lord, how do I say this to people? And I still have never taken a course on how to preach. I'm just thinking, Lord, what do they need to hear? And we say it. And God anoints it. Why? Because he wants to. And you can do the same thing. And people in this room are greater than what you think you are. I'm looking at mayors right now. This dude in the hat. You got a disposition about you, bro. Really powerful disposition. You just got that calm, quiet spirit, but it's, in, it's inward in you. Right? I'm looking at people who can be senators or people who can be uh, city councils, county councils, uh, town, uh, uh, what do they call them? School board members. At our church right now, we have four people running for office and we're endorsing them publicly. Screw the 51C3. We're done with this stuff. Right? Not because... We don't care about that, that applause stuff. What we're saying is, look, we better put our money where our mouth is. And if we want something to change, it starts with us. So now we have people running and they're, they're doing it and they have favor on their lives and they're, they're doing things and God, God's opening doors and we're seeing things happen. And it's like, okay, man, imagine if we'd have done this 10 years ago. Dang, right? But I love, you know what I love about the Lord? He doesn't operate on time. He'll redeem it. God doesn't operate on time like us. So it's not too far gone, dudes and dudettes. Fellers and fellettes, we got hope. Okay? We got hope. Let's continue. This is, uh, then we get to this point here. From 1735 and on, we get to 1774. You see this dude praying, Reverend Jacob Duchesne right there? He starts to pray. He opens up the session, First Continental Congress. He opens it up with a two-hour prayer service. I have a question. Don't raise your hands. I just want to ask, when is the last time any one of us in this room took two hours just to pray for our country? Or two hours to pray for our children and our family and their future families. Or our wives or our family members. Thank you. I'm a very sweaty fella. Right? How many of us have ever spent two and a half hours praying for our state and its politics? How many of us have taken two hours to pray for our employers? We may be mad at them, but you know what? The Bible says to pray for them. <laughs> exactly. I heard that. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of joy there, sir. I know. I heard. I got the joy, Jeff. Right? <laughs> I know. But you know what? That's what it's going to take because that's what it took for these fellas to have a nation. And I'll show you why. Psalm, or J, uh, John Adams actually said this after they prayed. He said, I never saw a greater effect upon an audience. It seemed as if heaven ordained for that psalm to be read on that morning. He wrote Psalm 30, They read Psalm 35 and he actually wrote this to his wife and he said, what happened in that room was indescribable. And did you guys know that from 1774 to 1816, we had over 1,500 Government issued days of fasting and prayer for our country, states included. Need again? Days of fasting and prayer. We do. We do. And I'm not telling you that you need to start it. I just think that in our nation, we all need to do it. And you'll see the Lord band together for us. This is Daniel Webster. Doesn't he look happy? No, his cousin was actually Noah Webster. Noah Webster uh, wrote the Webster's Dictionary. If you guys haven't done this yet, you guys should download the 1828 Webster's Dictionary uh, app on your phone. If you look up words from today and back then, completely opposite in a lot of ways. You guys should look it up yourselves. But, I mean, it's really cool. But this is his cousin, Daniel Webster. He was a Christian, an orator. He was a statesman, a uh, congressman. This dude was the bomb. And listen to this prophetic statement. He said this 220 years ago. He said, hold on, my friends, to the Constitution and to the Republic. Republic, 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 Republic. I will pound this in our heads that we are a republic, not a democracy. Someone's got to tell Fox News that, right? We're a republic to the republic for which it stands. Miracles do not cluster. 
And what has happened once in 6,000 years may not happen again. He said, hold on to the Constitution, for if the American Constitution should fail, there will be anarchy throughout the world. I mean, that was a very telling statement. And I'm going to talk about three miracles that happened at the founding that you maybe have never heard of. Some of you may have heard of them. And if you have, bear with me. But the reason I'm telling you about these miracles is because in each one of these miracles, it was flat out impossible for us to have a nation. And God delivered us. God delivered it to us, okay? So I want you guys to put everything out of your head, put every kind of hopelessness out of your head, put any kind of thing you think is attacking your family, because if you're truly the Lord's, I'm telling you, he's protecting yours. And we're going to pray after this, if you don't mind, because I love to pray and minister, okay? So we're going to talk about this. The most powerful king in history at the time was the king of Great Britain. Okay, you guys have heard this statement. You may have heard it once. New World Order? Yeah. Right? I'm going to show you what kind of world order was happening at that time. This is why I don't think we're done yet. Okay? I don't think we're done yet. I'll prove it through history and scripture, okay? Watch. Now, this doesn't mean to sit off, get off our laurels and not do anything. This actually means we're not done yet, but we could be close. So this is where we have to step up our game a little bit. And you know, I'm going I'm to say this to you guys right now. Some of you in this room may say, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. How many of us feel like that? I don't know what I'm supposed to do, right? I'm going to tell you something. When you start, God opens doors. There was no beam from heaven that came to me and said, you need to go preach in public schools. You need to go talk in colleges. There was no divine voice from heaven. It was like, wait a minute. I've been lied to my whole life. I need to tell somebody this. And he opened doors. I just got obedient with it, right? How do you dig a well, folks? You start you grab a shovel and you start digging. And you watch God open doors and close doors that you don't need to go through. I'm telling you, the more we do this, the more we'll overcome. But the most powerful king in history was the king of Great Britain. He controlled 13 million square miles under his rule. And he had over half a billion people under his rule. He had all of uh, India, which was a quarter of the world's population. Hong Kong, New Zealand, Australia, uh, e Egypt, Kenya, to South Africa, Canada, the Bahamas. And for a little while, he had the Americas. He had a little bit of Asia. That was about nine countries right there. And if you read scripture, it was ten nations that come together for a new world order. Okay? Now the Bible says too, there's going to be this antichrist that comes on the scene. He's going to deceive many, okay? Guys, Hillary Clinton is a pansy compared to what the antichrist will do. Obama, any, Bill Gates, those guys are pansies compared to what the antichrist will be. And they're not going to come off nefarious. They're going to come off as people of light. Okay? We haven't seen that yet. I don't see it yet. I don't. Now, I'm not saying we're not in the last days. Right? I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying we're in the end times. I just don't think we're in the last days yet. Okay? But I believe we're in the end times. That's been preached throughout history. The scriptures. But watch this. We decide. We have no navy, no army to break off from the superpower and say, we're going to win this thing. We're going to go after this. We're going to go defend our nation. How many of you guys feel ill-equipped? Even though you're doing this, you feel ill-equipped. Can we actually win this thing? Right? Well, they felt the same way, but they did it. They were obedient. And I'll show you why. In 1776, General Washington is in New York. Uh, the, it was the New York Harbor that filled with 400 British ships carrying 32,000 troops. And it was said that it looked like a, a forest out there with the thousands of wooden masts that were in New York Harbor. And in 1776, William Livingston, the general, proposed in Congress a day of fasting and prayer. Did you guys know that? May 17, 1776? They did a day of fasting and prayer? No, I was never taught that in school either. Isn't that crazy? Well, watch what they were doing. This is what they said. We observe this day as a, a day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer, that we all with united hearts confess and bewail our manifold sins and transgressions. And by sincere repentance towards God, we may incur his favor. What did that just say? We've got issues in our nation we're repenting for right now. Right? It's not just us grabbing guns and fighting. We had to repent a lot back then. You know why? Because slavery existed. Many things existed. Matter of fact, Abigail Adams told John Adams, do you think that we're fighting this war for the sin of slavery? That was one of her questions to him. So we had to repent a lot. And this was two months before signing the Declaration of Independence. And again, only 6% out of 3 million fought in this war. These guys had a conglomerate superpower coming against them. Now at that time, we only had 11,000 total men signed up to fight in the Revolutionary War. They just came over with 32,000. And that wasn't including what was already in existence in the territories. 
So 32,000 plus what they have existing and our 11,000, right? Game on. That's what they were saying. We're going to go do this thing. It's impossible. It's impossible. This is stupid, guys. Why are you meeting in a BFW? This looks ridiculous. Oh, you only have 30 people coming. Why are you guys doing this? Why are you even taking your time to do this? It's a waste of time. How many of you have heard this before? Yeah. Ah, it's too far gone, you guys. Might as well just pack it all up and leave, right? Mark Twain said this in the beginning of a contest. The patriot is scarce a man because he's ridiculed, mocked, and scorned. And then he says... When his cause succeeds, the timid then join him because then it costs nothing to be a patriot. Some of you will have to face the ridicule to get the followers. Some of us will. That's how it is. You'll have to get land based in the media. You'll have to get lied to by the media. You'll have to get lied to by your friends. When I got sick, or actually just recently, going into schools, do you know that I'm a homophobic hating bigot? I didn't even know that. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Like, at first, I was like, I don't even know what LGBTQ plus... Is that like a sandwich? What? Like, you know? <laughs> like, I didn't even know. We were just Christians. Right? You didn't even know. And all of a sudden, you're labeled. And you're putting the AP and the Associated Press and Yahoo. And they're writing about your band and your ministry and all this crazy stuff. And we're like, dude, we're just preaching the love of Christ. You know? You just have to get it. You have to face it. Washington wrote this because he had it read to his troops. In May 31st of 1776, he said this, listen to this. We expect a very bloody summer of it at New York. We're not either in men or in arms prepared for it. But then he says this. If our cause is just, though, as I do most religiously believe it to be, the same providence, which has in many instances appeared for us, will go on to afford its aid. God's with us. And we're going to go do this thing, right? I'm not going to go through all this because that's a different thing. Okay, here it is. Washington, then... He expects an attack from the sea, but a loyalist redcoat led 10,000 troops at night through Jamaica Pass and attacked the Continental Army from behind in August 27th, 1776. This was the tail end of the summer here. They lost 3,000 men that day, the Americans. So we had 8,000 people left. 8,000 ready to fight the war against 50,000, probably or more, right now, concurrently. This was our only army at the time, and British General Howe trapped 8,000 Americans on Brooklyn Heights and backed them up against the sea. That night, Washington had a great idea. He said, listen, it's nighttime. If we can get to Manhattan with all of our men, we can escape being ambushed in the morning. So he found every boat he could, and he ferried as many people, as many of his soldiers as he could, to Manhattan Island. But he had this great idea. He said, let's ferry the horses and the munitions first. Can, can you imagine being a soldier at that time? I can get a new horse, man. Get me on that boat. Stupid horse. Drowned him. I don't care. I want to, I want to live, right? And by the time the sun rose, only 4,000 soldiers out of 8,000 had already been, made it to Manhattan. They were freaking out. Watch this. This is so cool. Major Ben Talamash, uh, Washington's uh, chief of intelligence, he was actually a Frenchman. He wrote this in his journal. This is actually all in the Library of Congress, by the way. He says, as the dawn of the next day approached, those of us who remained in the trenches became very anxious for our own safety. You know what he just said in layman's terms today? We're crapping our pants last night. And we didn't know what to do. Right? So he says, when the dawn of the next day appeared, there were several regiments still on duty. And at this time, a very dense fog had appeared over both encampments. He actually said this, I recollect this peculiar providential occurrence perfectly well. And so very dense was the atmosphere that I could scarcely discern a person six yards distance. Six yards would be from probably me to her right here. I couldn't see anybody that far. Now, they say, this is actually recorded, that the fog lasted up until high noon, almost 1 o'clock. Let me ask you a question. You guys have driven through fog before. What happens when the sun rises? It goes away. The fog goes away. Yeah. Listen to this. We tarried until the sun had risen, but the fog remained as dense as ever. Washington was the last one on the boat. And as soon as the last boat left the island, the fog lifted. They came into ambush, and nobody was there. That's a miracle, isn't it? Yes. Can I ask a question? How come we were never taught this in school? You know why we pull them out of public schools? Because my kids are homeschooled too. I thought I was so smart. I graduated high school with a 3.7 GPA. I found out when I got around homeschool, it was just like a 1.2. <laughs> and they're 10, right? They're like smart. 
I'm realizing this more and more. Homeboy back there is talking to me. He's 20 years old, that boy back there. We're talking straight doctrine in the car. And I'm like, how do you? I'll shut up. Why am I even doing this, you know? But if you think about it, Washington wrote this two years, two years later. He said, the hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all of this, the course of the war, that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith. You could not have gone through this war and not become a believer. Right? And then he says this, but it will be time enough for me to turn preacher when my appointment ceases. He said, when this is all over, I'm going to start preaching, boys. And he did, ultimately. And I'm not going to go through that. There's a lot. Here's another one. You may have heard this one before, the bulletproof George Washington story. How many of you have heard this before? You have, you have. Shut your mouth. I don't know you, so I won't say that to you. Please stay quiet. I know him very well. Shut your mouth. Right? I can say that because preachers can. We can make up our own words, too. It's crazy. Right? It's in the Bible. It's in the book of uh, Hesitation somewhere. It's fine. Right? <clears throat> 1754, real fast, 22-year-old Colonel George Washington was fighting for the British. This was the French and Indian War. And they led 1,400 British troops, and they marched over the Appalachian Mountains, which we now know as Pennsylvania. And they were ambushed by French regulars. They were ambushed by uh, uh, Indian tribes, several Indian tribes, those kinds of things, over the Mon Monongahela River. And Washington was used to fighting in open field. Have you guys ever seen Mel Gibson's The Patriot? Yeah. Don't you ever want to yell at the TV set going, Hide, you morons! What are you standing there for? What are you doing? You know, hide! You know? He was used to that. This is the kind of style they were used to. But at this point, he'd never faced this before where they were ambushed and they had to hide. So Washington got on a horse and started riding in between both camps to deliver orders from General Braddock. General Braddock got up on his horse, got shot dead instantly, and two of his other generals got shot as well. The only one that survived it was General Washington. Now watch this. He wrote this account to his younger brother, John Washington. He said this, But by all the powerful dispositions of providence, I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectation. For I had four bullets go through my coat, and two horses shot from under me, yet I escaped unhurt, though death was leveling my companions on every side of me. Now this is where it gets better. Fifteen years later, one of the Indian tribes that had ordered to fire at him point-blank range ordered his men to stop. Fifteen years later, they brought an interpreter and they found General Washington walking with his doctor, Dr. Crape, okay? And this is what the chief ended up saying to General Washington through the translator. Again, this is all in the Library of Congress. He said, I'm a chief and ruler over my tribes. My influence extends from the waters of the Great Lakes to the far Blue Mountains. I have traveled a long and weary path that I might see the young warrior of the great battle. It was on this day when the white man's blood mixed with the streams of our forests. Really? Who got kidnapped right now? Couldn't they wait? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Is it a storm? No. Oh, no, Lord. I pray that they're not kidnapped in Jesus' name. I mean that. Um, sorry, let me go back. It says, on this, it, this is what the Indian chief was saying. It was on the day when the white man's blood mixed with the streams of our forest that I first beheld this chief. He was talking about Washington. I called to my young men and said, Mark, don't you see that tall warrior over there? He's not of the Red Coat tribe and he has an... I love this. It was getting good too. We're in on fire right now and then bam, right? So then the chief says this. He goes, don't you guys see that tall warrior over there? He said he's not of the Red Coat tribe and he has a warrior's fight like we do. He says this, himself below and exposed. He said this, the Indian chef said, quick, let your aim be certain, and he dies. Our rifles were leveled, rifle switch, but for you, you do not know how to miss. It was all in vain because of power mightier far than we shielded you. So they stopped. He ordered them to stop. And one of the soldiers that was with him on that day said this, I, one warrior declared, I had 17 fair fires at him with my rifle, and after all could not bring it to the ground. Seeing you were under the special guardianship of the great spirit, we immediately ceased fire on you. So something was protecting General Washington at that time. Something had to happen where these Indians were like, wait a second. And notice what the, the language they're using, the great spirit. If you guys have never read the Ten Commandments of the American Indian tribes, very eerily similar to the Ten Commandments of the Bible. And what they call the great spirit, we call the Holy Spirit. And what all that proves to me is this, not that their religion is fine or good or whatever. What that proves to me is God said in the word that the law of God is written on all men's hearts. Therefore, they're looking for something greater than themselves, and they found it, right? This is the reason Washington and Jefferson and those guys 
Well, Jefferson ripped out the New Testament works from his Bible and gave those copies to Indian, the Indian tribes because this was the Jesus they were seeking. You were never told that in school, I'm sure. Did you guys know in 1782, Congress printed Bibles for public schools? Why weren't we told that? You know what I mean? But we hear separation of church and state, mm -hmm. right? This kind of stuff. Now watch this. Then that Indian chief began to prophesy. This is the coolest thing ever, okay? And I'm sorry for you guys that didn't expect a church service. That was not my intent. I really didn't. I just want you to know I can't shut up about God. And we won't have a nation without the Lord. We won't. We just won't. Or our state, for that matter. This is the prophecy the Indian chief gave. I'm old and soon to be gathered to the great council of fire of my fathers in the land of shades. But here I go. There is something bids me speak in the voice of prophecy. He said, listen, the great spirit protects that man. And guides his destinies. He will become the chief of nations. And a people yet unborn will hail him as the founder of a mighty empire. I have come to pay homage to the man who is the particular favorite of heaven. And who can never die in battle. He was right. Again, was never taught this in school. Captain America, nothing. What about Captain Jesus, man? I'm serious. How come I, like, do you ever wonder, like, why wasn't I taught this? Why weren't we taught good things like how to balance a checkbook? You know? Well, here, let's teach our kids about sex ed. Or they can be boys if they want, if they're girls. You know, like this kind of crazy stuff. Here's one more miracle. Are you guys learning something? Oh, yeah. Praise God. Come on. So, one more miracle. One last miracle. I promise. It's almost over. Do you guys know what it means when a preacher says it's almost over? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> but it is almost over. I promise. February 21st, 1786, New Hampshire's Governor John Langdon issues a day of fasting. He says this, that, he would, that God would be pleased to bless the General Council of the United States of America and direct their deliberations, that he would rain down righteousness upon the earth, revive religion, and spread abroad the knowledge of God and the Savior of man. Isn't that crazy? That's what they wanted to do. Isn't that great? And at the Constitutional Convention, 55 writers of the U.S. Constitution got together. I just want to say this, men. How many of us... 55 of us could get into a room and agree on anything. We'd all be fighting about something, right? I love your plan. I was reading some of your plan back there, sir. Joel, I think it is. I was reading some of your plan, and I was like, hmm, I got questions, right? Not bad questions, like, hey, how would you do this? How would you do that? And you would come at me, and then someone else would be like, yeah, but I don't agree with that. This is what we need to... And here we have 55 men in a room deliberating our liberty and independence. Back then, the arguments were very simple. Here's one. Uh, the Federalists said... We're not, men are angels, so we need a strong government to make sure that we can restrain men's passions. True, men are angels. Some of them are wicked and creepy. The other side, the Antifederalists said, you're right, men are angels, so why give them authority and power? See the argument? How do we keep people free? Today's argument is, can we provide for children to get abortions? Do we, how much do we provide for the poor? Which, if you guys know anything about the Constitution, it's not just hearsay. You have to know your talking points, right? Nobody can tell me in the Constitution where it says they provide for the general welfare. And the general welfare did not mean welfare. If you read the Articles of Confederation, the word welfare meant the welfare of the states from foreign invading attacks. But then we twist words. And you know what they depend on? This is what every tyrant depends on, is your ignorance. You're, 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 so Martin Luther, I studied the Reformers for years. Martin, I made that. Wow, amen. <laughs> Perfect cast. Had the arm thing down. Woo, that was good. Sorry. Uh, so back in the day, Martin Luther, you know how they got religion across and how the Catholics got religion across? It's not about Catholics. It's about what was happening at that time because man can pervert anything, okay? They made the people illiterate. And so the Bible was written in Latin and only the priests could read the Bible. So therefore, the people believed anything. That's what was happening at the time. So then Martin Luther says, no, I'm going to write this thing in German. And he got persecuted for it and almost died because of it. And now we have different denominations of religion in Christ because of a guy like Martin Luther. Was he perfect? Absolutely not. But he obeyed. And you know what's so crazy, guys? What are our kids going to say about us in 100 years? Because isn't it crazy that our kids today are trying to point back at the errors that happened 240 years ago and try to hold them accountable for it? But yet, what are our kids going to say about us? Forget what happened back then. I can't change that, but I can sure have change what's happening now. Right? We can change this for our kids. Now let's continue. This is Benjamin Franklin. They actually called him a deist. Remember, this is the last miracle. 
What was happening at the time was in the Constitutional Convention, it was about to implode because nobody could agree on anything. We were about to go back to the Articles of Confederation. We were like, look, we can't agree on anything. Let's just get done with this thing. And then Benjamin Franklin, who was the deist, they called and claimed, this is what he said. I think he was 87 at the time. 87 years old. I want you guys to read this. He said, in the situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth, and scarce able to distinguish it when presented to us, how has it happened, sir, and he's talking to Washington, who's the president of the, Con or the um, Constitutional Convention, that we have not hitherto once thought humbly of applying the Father of lights to illuminate our understandings. He said, why is it that when we're doing this, we haven't even thought to ask God for help? Listen to this. In the beginning of our contest with Great Britain, we were sensible of danger, and we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. And all of us who are engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. And to that kind providence, he says this, we owe this happy opportunity of consulting in peace the means of establishing our, neutral, our future national felicity. And then he says this, and have we forgotten that powerful friend now? So all throughout the Constitutional Convention, they didn't pray. And he's like, wait a second. Did we forget the God who we first cried out to? And watch what he says here, last paragraph. He says, I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see that God governs in the affairs of man. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, can an empire rise without his aid? And then he says this, we've been assured in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. He said, I firmly believe this. And I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babylon. So he calls for a three-day recess. They adjourned. They go for three days, come back, and within two weeks of every day praying, they signed the Constitution of the United States. Keep in mind, it was about to dissolve on that day. They were ready to just tear it all apart. And then they got back to the foundation of God. Are you guys catching the theme here? I love True Texas Project. I've been speaking at these for how long? Three years. Three, four years, Three, four I think, four years. since almost they first started. And what I love about them is they acknowledge the Lord in everything they do. Are they perfect? No. No, they're not. But you know what? They're after the one who is perfect. And that's what's going to change our country. Listen, I love politics as much as the next guy. I love talking about this stuff. And I love talking to liberals. You know why? Not because they're stupid, but because... <laughs> not like that. <laughs> you said it. I didn't mean it like that. Not because I think they're stupid, because I don't. I just believe they're in darkness and they need the light. Yeah. Just like me, 17 years ago, 20 years ago, I got saved. I was a Democrat just like them. I believed in abortion. I believed that abortion was okay. My parents, when they became citizens, were labeled automatic Democrats. Uh, they were put in the system as Democrats. My dad raised me to say, Democrats are for the people, Republicans are for the rich people. So you want to always vote Democrat? I was raised like this. I didn't know anything better, right? And then God saved me. And then someone miraculously gave me a DVD on the real foundations of government. And then ever since then, I saw that God's hand in his... his Fingers all over history here, right? And then it made sense to me that I can't expect someone to change their political ideology without first changing their heart. That's when things begin to change. That's why we use both. That's why we preach. That's why I love being an assistant pastor. Because when I get pastors that say, we can't do this, I'm like, um, we are. And we're doing just fine. And yes, we get flat. Yes, we do. I can't tell you how many news stations have come out and try to catch us in what we're doing and all this other stuff. But I'll tell you what. There's something funny when you stand for the truth of Christ. People come. And they want to know more. You know why? Because you're not spineless at that point. You do really serve the God of heaven. And he doesn't bow to man. That's what I love. And that's the whole purpose of these classes. I'm not going to go through that. That's crazy. Um, here, I only have this quote here. Thomas Paine said this. If there be trouble, let it be in my day so that my child may have peace. That's it. That's why you do it. Because of that little fat head right there. Yes. Right? I mean fat head with all endearment. But that's why you do this. That's why you do this, guys. Because I want my kids to have a better Texas than Florida. I really do. I want my kids to have a better church. I don't want them to ever call us one day cowards. I don't ever want them to say we never stood for anything. And you know what? By the grace of God, they'll never say that about you. 
right? But now we have more people to go outreach to and disciple to do the same thing that we're doing now. You know why? So that when we do reclaim this nation back for the Lord, because I believe it can happen, then we don't have an excuse as to why it'll fail again. Amen? Amen. That's why we need to do it. He said this, and this single reflection, well applied, is sufficient to awaken every man to his duty. This is the last quote right here, I promise. I'm going to look here. He said this. This is John Adams' quote, and I just, I, I, I want this tattooed on my arm. And if you don't think that tattoos are Christian, quit judging me. <laughs> but as he said this, posterity, future generations. He said, you'll never know how much it costs this present generation to preserve your freedom. He said, I hope you make good use of it, because if you don't, I shall repent in heaven. Ooh. He said, I shall repent in heaven that I took half the pains to preserve it. I think about dudes like Paul in scripture, you know, or Peter's or the Timothy's or the, the Stevens, you know, those guys who gave it all up for one cause, which was Jesus. These guys did the same thing in their own way. They saw what was given to them and they did it and they stood. And now we have a nation because someone saw fit to die for them. And this whole theory about the Constitution being written by rich white dudes, how many of those rich white dudes died broke? And without families. How many of their kids died for the cause of the war? How come we don't talk about that? Huh? Or that this nation was the first nation of its kind to destroy slavery by a bunch of Christians? Huh? Or why don't we talk about that? In this nation, we didn't have debt the way we have it until now. Because our founders saw fit to make sure we wouldn't leave debt to our children. And yet we've seen both Republicans and Democrats increase the debt, the national debt of our nation. And put our kids further in peril. And yes, I mean both. And both parties allowed the, the slaughter of 60 million babies. And both parties allowed the destruction of our public schools. And both parties. It's not the party that will save this nation. It won't be. President Trump did some cool things. There's no question. And I supported him and I backed him up. But he was not perfect. And one man will not save this nation, guys. we got to get off this train. It's going to start with all of you. And every one of you is here, listen to me closely, you're here for a reason. You didn't come here to hear complaints. And if you did, you're in the wrong place because this place will make you engage. You're here because you feel like there's something you need to do for your state, for your kids, for your grandkids, right? For, for, for other people who don't have a family. Listen, you are of the elderly persuasion, right? I don't want to say you're old. I don't know if you're old or not, but I'll say this. You know how many kids out there don't have a mom and dad? Did you know that every two hours in this country, a kid 7th through 12th grade up to 20 years old commits suicide? Every two hours. So as soon as this meeting's over, you know what I'm thinking about when I'm driving home? Is that someone else killed himself. And did they know Christ? Did they know? Could I have just been there for one second, Lord, to just reach out to that kid? Because you know what? When I was in suicide, someone reached out to me. And thank God for that. But each one of you has a story for these kids. Each one of you has a story for your neighbor. Folks, listen. You know how hard it is to preach the gospel? You know where they're at? How many of us have neighbors that you know have never heard the gospel? They're right there. They're right there. It's not even just about the gospel. When that's preached and they receive Christ, now what? We get them active about the service. We get them active about what they're called to do. And you watch God move on their behalf. Amen? That's what this is about. I believe this, that we're in for some tumultuous days. There's no question. But I truly, 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 Old Testament, New Testament proves it, that he always spares his remnant. Always. And I don't care what comes against us. I know God's on our behalf. Is it going to be easy? No. No, it never was meant to be. Right? If it was easy, everybody would do it. But he says with God, all things are what? Awesome. Amen. So when it's impossible, who do we run to to make it possible? Guys, we said for years, we're going to, remember, Angel, I said in, back in October, I used to say this for years, we're going to see Roe Ro versus Wade overturned in our country. I got laughed at so many times in universities. No freaking way I would hear, I hear the actual word. I might as well just said it, but they said it. I won't say it because I'm a pest. You know what I mean? Can't, can't do that. Can't cross. Separation of church and state. You know what I mean? We can't cross like that. But I would hear that, no effing way. There's no way. And God does it. Who would have thought that a football coach would win a case about prayer in public schools? Who would have thought? Huh? We're seeing something change where now those same judges are saying, now we need to go after marriage. Why did the Supreme Court write about marriage? 
See what I'm saying? So the tide is turning in our favor. Now's not the time to let up. It's time to hit the gas. Now's the time. And that's why you're here. That's why you're here. The purpose of this class was not to tell you anything new. Some of you know the Constitution maybe better than I do. I don't know. But here's what it was going to hear, here to tell you. If you lose hope, run to the one who gives you hope. Because he's the one that's going to carry you when you don't have any. As a matter of fact, he doesn't want you to have any in himself. He wants you to have it in him. Yeah, right. That's it. He wants you to have it in him. And that's why we do this. So it's been nine years for us. My kids have heard me bellyache about this stuff for years. And you know what? They keep telling me every time I go out, Dad, go get another one. Go save more. Go save more. And hopefully one day that little dude right over there will do the same thing. Carbon copy of me anyway. But I mean, he'll probably do the same thing. I pray. I don't know. I don't know. But we're raising our children to do this. You know why you fought? I look at you and I go, she's way more than a homeschool mom. I see the next Bevere's wife, Lisa Bevere. You're supposed to be speaking, girl. You got a voice. There's some powerful God smiles on you. He hears your worship. He hears your prayers. He hears you in the times when you're in your kitchen, right? You're cutting things and you're just singing to God. He sees all that stuff. You, when he's watching you pray over your children or when you're doing things with it, like, he's seeing all that stuff. He's seeing everything you're doing and he's blessing you, right? Bro, I'm telling you, there's more for you. I don't know what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life, but it certainly is not what you're doing now. I believe you're supposed to be in the highest courts of office. Dude, you have that authority in you, that power in you. I've always known that. Ever since I've seen you, it's like, you're the guy that goes, eh, it's just not for me. No, it is for you. Matter of fact, you know how I knew it was the Lord? Because I didn't want to do it. That's how I knew it was the Lord. It was the hardest thing I ever had to do was do this because I had a business that was being very lucrative. And the Lord said to do this, and I was like, no. And then he kept telling me, and I said, no. And he kept telling me, and I said, no. And then finally, guess who won? Yeah. Not me. And you know what? I, I don't mind it anymore. Because my wife, she don't, when she was diagnosed with cancer, I was going to cancel our South Carolina tour. We had a tour for four days. I said, I'm going to cancel it because, you know, I need to stay home with you. She just got home from the hospital. You know what she told me? I already booked your plane tickets. You better move. You got to move. We got to preach. Nobody told you to stop, she said. My wife, who just got out of the hospital from surgery, she didn't want to be baby. She goes, I got friends. They're cool. You need to go. And that, that, I mean, that's like what we need from each other, to carry each other. Amen? I'm going to pray real fast. Did you guys get something out of this? Yes. Praise the Lord. Come on. So I'm going to pray real fast, if you don't mind. And then uh, we, can, we can, are we done with time? Three minutes. Perfect. Come on. Woo. <laughs> All right. Um, and if you guys want prayer afterwards, I love praying for people. It's awesome. Okay. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, God, for the destruction of wickedness in this country. Lord, when I see the problems being exposed now, it's not because the nation is more wicked. It's because you've answered our prayers. And, Lord, the kingdom of heaven is exposing the darkness for us to stand against. Lord, I thank you for hope in these people today. I thank you for those who have grandkids and great-grandkids. I pray, Father, that they would see with their own eyes everything they've sown into, Father. If they've been praying for their children, I pray you show them the fruit of their prayers, Lord, like you did to William Wilberforce when it ended slavery. Father, those that are parents in this room, I just thank you, Lord, that your peace is on them, Father. And you would strengthen them and show these two especially, Father, and her over here, that, Father, you're the right mom for the right kids at the right time. Don't question it. Father, that the dads in this room know that they're called to be the fathers of future world changers. And that, Lord, it is on them to pray for those kids. It is on them to raise those kids. It is on them to teach their kids about Scripture and the Word of God and how to stand like a man. And I thank you for our daughters, Father, that they're protected by you. That, Lord, when there's wickedness coming against them, Father, that your angels would protect them in the name of Jesus. And I just thank you, Father, for this group that it continues to grow and increase. And I thank you for more people to run for public office who stand on principle, Father, and are not wavered by the flesh. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you. Amen.